My name is Jan Hüsken, and I have the honor and pleasure to be one of the co-organizers of this conference, together with Sarah Frund and Larissa Förster. I would like to introduce my co-panelists for today to you that are in the order of their appearance, Rakesh Ankit, Riley Leinbo, Fabienne Chamelot, and Forget Chaterera Zambuco. Ah, good, it works, Rakesh. Good to see you. Um, the first paper will be presented by Dr. Rakesh Ankit, who studied history at Daly, Oxford, and Southampton universities. He is lecturer in history and international politics at Loughborough University and a specialist in the history of decolonization and the Cold War in India. His most recent book publication has been India in the Interregnum Government, September 1946 to August 1947, and has been published by Oxford University Press in 2019. Our next panelist is Riley Leinbow. Good to see you as well. <laughs> who is currently in the very last week of finishing her PhD. So I'm very grateful that she joins us today, today although she has a troublesome time. Um, Riley is currently doctoral fellow at the Leibniz Institute for European History in Mainz. Her research focuses on decolonization and archival restitution debates. Um, her PhD, based at Justus Liebig University, in Gießen is the first systematic history of record removal and subsequent dispute following decolonization of the British Empire with a focus on Kenya and Eastern Africa. She holds an MA in archival studies and worked professionally as an archivist in England, Uganda, and the United States. She has recently um, published a co-authored article, um, um, The Archival Color Line, Race Records, and Post-Colonial Custody. Our third panelist is Fabienne Chamelot. She is a PhD candidate and has recently submitted her thesis at Portsmouth University. Her research explores French colonial administration and policy in the 20th century, focusing specifically on the management and organization of colonial archives throughout the empire and within the French state. She has an MA in social science from the École des Eaux d'Etudes en Sciences Sociales and the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, uh, and spent one year as a visiting student at the New York University. She is co-author of the article Archives, the Digital Turn and Governance in Africa, that has been published in the journal History in Africa in 2019. Finally, I would like to introduce and welcome our interlocutor for this panel, Dr. Forget Chaterera Sambuku, as an assistant professor at Sorbonne University Abu Dhabi. She's previously lectured at the National University of Science and Technology and the Midland State University in Zimbabwe. She is a rated researcher of the National Research Foundation of South Africa and an editor for Archives and Records Journal. Her research interests include displaced archives, access to archives, and the application of emerging technologies in records and archives management. She has published numerous articles on the topics of assessing and using documentary heritage, and she is co-curator of a digital exhibition on archival return, lost unities, and exhibition for archival repatriation. Before I now step aside in order to give floor to the panelists, let me just briefly introduce the topic of this panel. In the first two days of the conference, we have now already heard many case studies on how claims for the return of material cultural heritage and human remains were made, or how societies tried to resist plundering and looting. Within the last two days, the Cases of the return of manuscripts have been briefly touched by Walbert Smith and Klaus Dutje, and research within the colonial archive has at least formed the basis for many presentations. Although colonial archives are different from cultural objects, claims for return or access to archives are as well of important or are as well of importance in this aim to point out the long durée of the current debates on colonial collections. Archives contain records that are an essential part of the cultural heritage for the societies in which they were created. One prominent example is the handover of the Witboy papers by the Übersee Museum Bremen to the National Archives of Namibia in 1996 and their registration in the UNESCO Memory of the World in 2005. For this reason, archives are also protected by the Hague Convention of 1954 and the UNESCO Convention of 1970. 
when this panel talks about the colonial archive, it refers to archival records and archival institutions that were created and maintained under colonial rule. In the process of decolonization, the archives of the colonial powers were partly taken out of the country and thus withdrawn from the control of the former colonized. As Felvin Saar and Benedict Savoy have pointed out in their report, access to the archives that have been constituted in the colonial era are of significant importance in order to reconstruct colonial histories. Even if the composition, and by which I mean, for example, the colonial governance of the records and the colonial gaze in the sources is problematic, access to archives is one important precondition for critical historiography. Nonetheless, the return of the colonial archives does not occupy much space in current debates on how to deal with cultural goods and collections on colonial contexts. Most of the recent discussions on colonial archives are limited to questions of accessibility, training of archivists and digitization, but not on request of the return of archives to the former colonies. However, as a recent survey on disputed archival claims by Joel James Lowry points out, there are at the moment at least 17 claims that deal with disputes on the displacement of archives as a result of decolonization. This reminds us that the colonial politics in the case of archives have been maintained in many cases since several decades. So I would argue that in the case of archival returns, we are still waiting for the Berlin Wall moment if we think of the keynote of Benedict Savoir yesterday. Another important point is the value of archival sources as pieces of evidence for colonial violence that was committed under colonial rule. For example, the requests for return of archives are connected with reparations for slavery. The following presentations will point out the long history of claims for the return of colonial archives and the complex negotiation processes to gain access or the administrative power of the archives. The three papers will focus on case studies from the French and British colonial empires and on our case studies from Africa and India. They will argue in how far colonial structures persist until now in the case of colonial archives and what challenges arise from the process of nation building in the era of decolonization. So I would now like to go to hand over to our first speaker for today and um, I welcome Rakesh Ankit. I'm glad you are here and I'm looking forward to your presentation in trust for the three nations, the India Office Library and Records Dispute 1947 to 1972. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, Ian. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, the organizers for this invitation and to the online audience. I hope I'm audible. And um, please do um, point out if I'm either too loud or um, not audible at all. I have about 15 minutes and I wish to narrate a story which may be familiar to a few of us, uh, which may not be familiar to some others. It's titled In Trust for the Three Nations with a question mark. The India Office Library and Records Dispute for the 25 years from 1947 to 1972. Now my talk aims to provide, but a picture of the tripartite exchanges between the British, Indian and Pakistani governments in the decades of 1950s and 1960s on this dispute. While not comparable to the so-called lost, migrated and burnt archives of the colonial foreign and commonwealth officers from East Africa, or Southeast Asia. The implications of this dispute too can be framed within a familial history of British decolonization, thus fitting in with some of the remits of this conference. As it has been recently asked by the scholarship, how does decolonizing history relate to the study of decolonization itself? So this talk attempts an answer with an episode from the said decolonization in British India. If records are, quote, the glue that restores shattered histories. Then the British determination to retain the India Office Library and Records exclusively is revealing of a resistance to reimagine others' interest in a shared historical identity. Now the story goes back to 1864, when the current Whitehall site, where stands the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, was purchased by the Secretary of State for India for an amount of over 86,000 pounds 
drawn out of Indian revenues. It was vested in Her Majesty's government for the services of the governance of India. And this is the key phrase that will come up again and again. Vested in Her Majesty's government, but for the services of the governance of India. It was followed by the construction of the present building. Those of you who have been to London must have seen it, which housed back then the India office, which was ready by the year of 1870 at about half a million pounds. By then, New Delhi, the then government of British India, had been providing annually for the building, for the records, and for the library that was established in the year 1801. It continued in that building till 1967, a full 150 odd years. The library was that of the former East India Company. It was purchased from the East India Company at a very handsome sum of about 30 million pounds. And it was maintained by New Delhi till the year 1937, after which a lump sum was paid. The point of throwing down these figures is to show you that there was a financial side to this unfinished business of empire. Now, apart from its esoteric collections, rare books, museum pieces, the major jewel in the library's crown, and for the historian's purpose, was the India office record, which was there because it was not considered a part of the public records of the United Kingdom, given precisely this financial acquisition. Now, the situation continued till the Government of India Act of 1935, which vested the property of the India office in His Majesty for the purposes now of His Majesty's government in the UK, as against the earlier wording, which was for the services of the government of India. And it is this technical uh, you know, set of six words on which this entire dispute, the legal side of it at least, hinges. Vested in His Majesty's government for the governance in UK versus vested in His, in His Majesty's government for the services of the government of India. In 1935, the India office building became a treasury office. Twelve years later, when India was to be uh, given independence, the draft bill of the Indian Independence Act had a clause for transferring the India office and it contends to the sole control of London. But this clause crucially was omitted at the instance of the last Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten. Instead, in October, three months after the transfer of power in British India to the governments of India and Pakistan, a fact-finding committee was set up. But New Delhi, given the terrible, terrible conditions that accompanied the transfer of power in North India, sought a postponement and this committee actually never met. But crucially, the British member of this committee did not put forward any exclusive claim for British ownership of the India office. Rather, he distinguished among the collections based on whether they were purchased by British funds or not. The matter gathered dust at this stage for good eight years. It was only in the summer of 1955 that our story properly starts to take shape. The education ministers of India and Pakistan that year issued a joint statement claiming ownership of the India Office Library and its contents. In its response, Alec Douglas Hume, the then Minister for Commonwealth Relations, a future Prime Minister, stated that the library belonged to Her Majesty's government, though the government could consider any suggestion that India and Pakistan may have in regard to its administration. And shortly afterwards, the education ministers of India and the UK, Abul Kalam Azad and Alec Douglas Hume met and uh, suggested reviving that 1947 fact-finding committee so that the records could be classified, categorized, and perhaps allocated to the three countries. Instead, the Commonwealth Relations Office went back to that critical legal advice on the wordings of the 1935 Act, vested in the government for the governments. And given that the transfer of power had now been effected in India, it was decided that that legal position was rather sound and unimpeachable. Now this was um, so far so good. The British High Commissioner in India Malcolm MacDonald, though, had a slightly different view. He understood that this was not merely a legal question. He felt that the Indians and the Pakistanis had based their case on political and moral considerations. And MacDonald pushed for a different approach, less legalistic and more hinging on joint ownership, joint management, on the condition that the India Office Library is kept intact where it is. 
The intergovernmental silence was finally broken in June 1959 when the governments of India and Pakistan jointly gave a note in London to the Foreign and Commonwealth and the uh, uh, Commonwealth Relations Office uh, on the India Office Library. And what the note basically demanded was for the government of United Kingdom to recognize that it is the government of India and the government of Pakistan who are the joint owners. While they agreed that for the time being, for a number of logistical reasons, the India Office Library and its plentiful records, rare manuscripts, portraits, pictures, sketches, jewels, they should all remain in London. Malcolm MacDonald very swiftly offered a joint offer in which the ownership shall be shared, in which the management shall have a board from all three, in which there'll be a worthy upkeep in a special building designed to safeguard the contents. And finally, that a tripartite committee would set up a trust which would look after this uh, library and its records, much like the British Museum. Hence the title of my talk, In Trust for the Three Nations. From spring 1960, this formula was trialed out on the visiting Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and the visiting Pakistani President General Ayub Khan, both of them, both of whom were rather taken aback because they felt that this was furthering the status quo. Rather, they wanted uh, the legal and the political, the financial and the moral position to be considered by a judiciary committee of the Privy Council. They wanted to reopen the legal foundations of this, this setting up around transfer, around ownership, and around financial management. By now, uh, deep in the throes of the cultural and the educational cold war that was starting to blow in South Asia as well, the Indian Minister for Culture came to London in 1960 and claimed that only 20% of the library's users were British, while 40% made the uh, uh, financially onerous journey from the subcontinent to come and access the records and the archives. And so therefore, yet another personal solution was being offered in that uh, all the books insofar as possible could be Xeroxed and photostat. The manuscripts insofar as possible could be microfilmed and shared and the records could be thus copied in three copies and shared among the three countries. While as far as the art objects are concerned, on a formula wherein India and Pakistan share them among themselves, the Persian objects, the Sanskritic objects, the Arabic objects, and certain other objects of other provenances could thus be divided among the three countries. Now, London had no issues with any of this claim, but London's issue was that a number of scholars from Europe and from the United States of America, especially where the Ford Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation were starting to set up South Asian departments in different universities like Chicago, like Michigan and elsewhere. Many of, very many of these scholars used to come here to England to access these archives. And this represented a loss of as much revenue as influence, as much cultural and political capital as historical heritage claim. And so from roughly the 1960, 61, 62 onwards, a bad tempered debate around claims and counterclaims of legal jugglery, around claims and counterclaims of financial logistics, around claims and counterclaims of moral case, uh, wherein who is interested in the study of British Indian history? Who is to be allowed to write the British Indian history? Should it be accessible to the British people as opposed to the Indian and Pakistani people? Could there be a possibility of making it accessible to both? Uh, thus, the debate started to be framed in the early 1960s on this question of sharing or dispersal, vandalism or division, return or restitution of the India Office Library and its archives. Uh, and, and, and how far would it handicap the relationships between India, Pakistan and Britain at a time when Indian studies was in um, the uptick in both the United States and in the former so Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, the USSR. Now, if you think that I have been rather animated and uh, rather uh, exercised by some of it, then perhaps it is because all this hectic activity that has 
injected all this excitement in my presentation, flattered to deceive. By 1962, as uh, Indochina relations worsened and headed towards a war, shortly thereafter, followed by the death of the Indian Prime Minister in 1964, and India-Pakistan war itself in 1965 and Ayub's departure, this issue in effect became a frozen case. By the time an epilogue was produced and the issue was revived in early 1970s, there was yet another Clement to the India Office Library and Records. This was the newly formed government of Bangladesh, which too sought its own share. Pakistan by now was out of the Commonwealth under a new President Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who was willing to forego the antiquarian material if he could receive a photostat reproduction of the paper tray of the records. The question as ever was who would foot the bill. By now, the India office library and records had moved out of the India office. There was no India office as such anymore. They were in a different uh, uh, lodgings. And so by the late 1970s and early 1980s, as the political sting got out of this conversation, it became purely a case of doing business. How to supply microfilms to the Indians, to the Pakistanis, and now to the Bangladeshis. And the market, which was bargaining, what was the constructive answer? And there was only one. If the three countries renounce their claims, we'll consider a limited exchange of microfilms of materials missing from each. The amount would be split and everybody benefits by the exchange, not least Her Majesty's government here in the United Kingdom. Once in a while, there would be an echo of the old doubt. On what specific ground was the Indo-Pakistani claim to ownership back in the 1960s was rejected? Were those grounds holding validity or not? So to conclude this, uh, this sort of um, unsatisfactory, unfinished, and rather um, a frittered away slice of uh, historiographical history. Uh, taking records to the scholarly apparatus provided by Jordana Belkin, she has recently asked, where is the archive of decolonization? The India Office Library Records dispute can be offered as an answer. As it shows the passing of empire from political to historical realm without an accompanying transfer of power to see, to examine, and to write. Instead, whether referring to judicial arbitration or offering a board of trustees or accepting copying, filming on payment, each represents arguably a reconfiguration of imperial power against independent nation states. One, two, three, and there are others lest we forget, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, and Afghanistan, all in the realm of the former British Indian Empire. The riches of the library and the museum were prospectively retained. The papers of the India Office records were retrospectively, retrospectively ratified under the Public Records Office in the United Kingdom. Their location today under lock and key in London is not merely a matter of nostalgia, but one of hard business. It is not solely about the history of empire, but also the politics of its heritage, its historiography. So to paraphrase Belkin, where did the India Office Library and Records go when the India Office went in 1947? The answer, uh, and I'm sure in this audience people would know, the answer is 96 Euston Road on the fourth floor in the corner of the British Library. Out goes the name, in goes the archives. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to other papers in the queue. Thank you so much, Rakesh, for this very interesting and um, yeah, forwarding paper. I um, yeah, with uh, this quite um, complex history of this case, and um, yeah, I was especially interested in uh, how universities and research politics were used as a kind of neo-colonial approach to get um, to keep on this record. So maybe we can get to back to that later in the discussion. That's uh, quite interesting. I um, would now like to hand over to our next speaker, Riley Lido. <laughs> Riley, Riley L, yes. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, great. Um, with her paper, Pursuing Colonial Archival Restitution, the Kenyan Case. Thank you, Riley. Sure, just to confirm with those of you with your videos on that you can hear me. Great, okay, then I will go ahead and share my screen for a presentation. <clears throat> 
And can you also confirm with a nod of the head that you see now on full screen? Fantastic. Okay. So now moving a little bit through space, but not so much through time. I bring you to the 24th of November, 1965, when the parliaments of Kenya assented the Public Archives and Documentation Service Act, thereby legally codifying a national archive for a state that was not yet two years old after 80 years of colonial domination by Britain as a settler colony. The act defines public archives as those which have been in existence for a period of not less than 30 years. What would be the purpose of a post-colonial national archive before any public records of the new government could be considered for permanent preservation? The act laid out several functions of the chief archivist, one of which was to take such steps as may be necessary to acquire and have returned to Kenya any public records or records of historical value to Kenya which may have been exported before the commencement of this act. An original aim of Kenya's National Archive was thus to oversee the restitution of records removed prior to independence. So in my paper today, I will raise and discuss three examples of archival restitution attempts by the Kenyan government from 1966 to today. Before doing so, it's important to emphasize at the beginning of this talk that the recovery and reclamation of history was a central struggle of African nationalism in Kenya and elsewhere as a counterpoint to the way in which colonial historical thoughts had cast Europeans as the continent's greatest protagonists, benevolently raising the heart of darkness to the status of the civilized. Kenya National Archives or KNAs origins and early development was a refusal of this story. This conference has been organized in order to historicize current debates by anal analyzing a long history of resistance against colonial dispossess dispossession through the articulation of claims for the return of cultural heritage. To do so frames cultural heritage disputes as proxy conflicts through which not just the ownership and placement of objects, but the conditions that facilitated their extraction are contested. This paper and this panel raise the specific issues of colonial archives, which are related, but importantly distinct from cultural objects. Among their differences is that the ongoing possession of certain colonial archives by European imperial powers is not just symbolic, but constitutive of imperial duress. In other words, the maintenance of colonial administrative files in London and other former metropoles partly preserves the conditions that facilitated colonial conquest and extraction, namely the political control over the evidence of empire. So with that argument as my aim, I will begin my presentation with a brief introduction to the historical context behind Kenya's pursuit for archival restitution. I will then discuss three examples of document restitution attempts by the Kenyan government through its national archives. These include discussions with Oxford University in 1966, attempts to establish a bicultural, um, bilateral cultural agreements with the UK government starting in 1967, and finally the delicate matter of pursuing sensitive and secret records that the British colonial governments removed from Kenya to London around the time of independence. I will conclude with a few remarks on the present moments of colonial reckoning in Europe with reference to the question of archival restitution. Driven by debts in the late 19th century, British colonial officers surveyed the British East Africa Protectorate for economic potential and identified the lands most suited for agricultural production. The territory was established as a settler colony and administered through a system of direct rule in a tripartite racialized form for the purpose of revenue generation. This resulted in mass expropriation of the peoples inhabiting the most fertile lands in favor of settlements of white peoples from South Africa, England, Ireland, and elsewhere from Britain's white dominions. In 1919, the UK government launched a huge settlement scheme wherein former soldiers of, quote, pure European origin were allocated land in Kenya. On the screen before you is an image of the Happy Valley sets, a group of aristocratic settlers 
who turned to the Abadair mountain range as a set setting to indulge in decadent lifestyles in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And this was one expression of the vision to make Kenya another, quote, white man's country along the lines of South Africa. By 1945, the settler population amounted to just over 23,000 compared to the African population of over 5 million. However, through law and force, they held the political, social, and economic power in the central highlands of Kenya, a stark inequality that was defended on racialist terms of superiority. So frustrations about subordination, especially land theft, resulted in different forms of protest in Kenya. In October 1952, the British colonial government declare, declared a state of emergency purportedly against the more militant wing of African nationalism known as Mau Mau, or the Kenya Land and Freedom Army. The British colonial government authored a substantial propaganda offensive against Mau Mau, calling its members terrorists and savages capable of unthinkable violence. This narrative effort corresponded with the organization of a system of detention, work and rehabilitation camps, wherein the systematic use of torture and violence indiscriminately target certain linguistic communities out of a general suspicion of Africans. The emergency resulted in incalculable loss of human life through the spread of disease at camps, starvation campaigns, arbitrary executions, and physical torture. By 1956, the military campaign was largely over and constitutional negotiations for political independence began in 1960. So what do these huge historical generalizations have to do with independent Kenya's pursuits of archival restitution? In 1961, two years before independence, the British colonial government systematically identified certain documents to destroy or remove from Kenya to London before colonists left their political office. These records largely dealt with the emergency period. They included information about torture allegations, decision-making chains that clarified the awareness and authority of not just Kenya's governor, but the UK Secretary of State during the emergency. They detailed the lengths to which the government tried to cover up the loss of African life during the period and the methods of concealment. So the criteria for record removal is now listed on the screen. In 1964, just a year after Jomo Kenyatta entered office as Kenya's first prime minister, the former colonial governor informed the new cabinet that certain documents had been removed to London. A year after, Kenyatta's government passed the National Archives Act, authorizing its chief archivist to see to their return. And I'll return to this case as the presentation's third point, but it's important to, to point out that these were not the only documents pursued by the Kenyan National Archives. Awareness in Kenya of mass document destruction upon independence was widespread. And thanks to media reports, it also became known to an international public, among whom was Marjorie Purim. In 1961, Purim was at the end of a 40 year career at Oxford University, where she had pioneered the academic field of colonial administration, which prepared officers for work in the colonies. Upon hearing the news of document destruction in Kenya, Purim wrote to the colonial governor about, quote, the future of the documents dealing with Mau Mau. Purim believed that, quote, there is a natural temptation for Africans to exaggerate the harshness of repression, and that, quote, it must be left to historians to sift all the evidence when passions have cooled. Among her reactions to the end of empire and concern for its documentary traces, Purim launched the Oxford Colonial Records Project in order to acquire and preserve the private papers of imperial administrators in order to keep safe the viewpoints of those Purim and her contemporaries had so highly revered and whose reputations they feared would be tarnished by the perspectives of independent Africans and other critics of empire. And so the project set out an appeal to the white peoples of Britain's falling empire. A few years after the project got its start, a member of the Kenya's Archives Advisory Council learned that some of Kenya's settlers and politicians were sending their documents to Oxford. The member advised KNA staff, I have come to learn that a considerable number of documents touching on the history of this country have been sent to Oxford. The Advisory Council further agreed that the, quote, fear of reprisal prevented settlers from donating their records to the National Archives in Kenya, 
favoring Oxford, a sympathetic co-conspirator in commemorating the British Empire. In 1966, assistant archivist A.H. Kamau traveled from Kenya to the UK for a training course, and in doing so visited Oxford. He approached the project's coordinator, Mr. Tawney, about sending file lists from Oxford to the Kenya National Archives so at least the institution would be aware of Kenya-related re records elsewhere. Through his own initiative, Kamau thus initiated an inter-institutional cooperation that Tawney then subsequently cited as a way to boost the reputation of the project, a power dynamic that persists, I would argue, into contemporary restitution projects between Africa and Europe. In 1973, an inter-ministerial committee on the retrieval of Kenya archives from overseas countries formed under the office of the president. Although the committee operated with a wide understanding of Kenya archives in overseas countries, for example, it corresponded with the director of India's national archives, it sent a delegation to tour the United States, and even contacted German and Japanese embassies. It was focused largely in England, and although the Kenya government was aware that the outgoing colonial, colonial administration had removed many important politically relevant records related not just to the emergency, but also the political record of the Legislative Council, border commissions, and foreign affairs, it did not know exactly the extent or the location of these records. It therefore arranged for a survey. During its 1975 meeting, the committee resolved that a quick intelligence gathering survey of our records and documents available in Britain is an immediate matter. This should be undertaken so as to determine what they are, where they are found, the institution or individuals holding them, and how to acquire them. With this sort of information, we can then approach the British government with substantial evidence. Over the next 10 years, the Kenya government surveyed and paid for copies of Kenya-related records in England in accordance to a joint heritage framework articulated by international organizations such as UNESCO and the International Council on Archives. It used diplomatic channels strategically in order to try and convince the UK governments to admit to and return the removed archives. While the UK sold copies, microfilm copies of public records held in its own central archive to the Kenyan government, it kept those it had removed before independence and in secret, locked up in steel cages, as you see on the screen before you, at Hayes Repository outside London. These records were joined by thousands of other documents sent from around the globe and referred to by the UK as the, quote, migrated archives. From the late 1960s until the early 1980s, the Kenyan government made several attempts to learn the whereabouts and see to the return of these migrated archives. Their attempts were, at first sight, unsuccessful. Meanwhile, the UK government received other requests from former colonies. We've heard about the Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi case, and wherein the UK fashioned a solution through the British Library. But among the migrated archives were hordes of records from 37 colonies. In the early 1980s, the UK was unwilling to reveal these records because it was still covertly removing sensitive documents from its colonial territories, and in order to avoid embarrassment for other European powers in similar positions. In other words, record removal to service British geopolitical and reputational interests was ongoing. Before coming to an end, I want to share a few reflections on colonial reckoning and the question of archival restitution. On the screen before you is a choreographed image of Jomo Kenyatta's arrest in 1952. Misidentified as a Mau Mau leader, Kenyatta was detained for the duration of the emergency. His political image within Kenya was contested after independence and remains so. Whose hero was he? Kenyatta prolonged the colonial era ban on Mau Mau, which remained in place until the early 2000s. He curated a vision of the past and, and his role in it to accord with a vague idea of national unity to conceal his form of favoritism, allocating lands and power to a select few. On the screen is a painting he commissioned to revisualize his origins as the nation's father. Kenya's historiography, like all nations, is layered with different contests of legitimacy. 
There have been periods in the country's history where critics have felt emergency records were safer stored in England at home than at home. Rewriting the history of Mau Mau continues to be an exercise in political imagination in Kenya and a language of critique as the common comic on the screen illustrates. And so I ask, what role does the absence of these records play in that? In 2019, Patrick Gathara offered an answer. He argued that returning colonial archives would allow Africans to begin constructing more accurate narratives of colonial experience. Other African scholars and thinkers argue otherwise, that the continent's museums and archives are overloaded with the biases and violence of colonists. But it is not just the writing of history which is at stake. The UK's migrated archives came to light in 2011 due to the ongoing struggle of Kenya's freedom fighters to assert their sovereignty through action. A lawsuit against the British government for torture resulted in the release of these documents as pertinent legal evidence into the National Archive in England where they remain. Hostile borders, costly visas and travel make these records virtually inaccessible to most of those whose lives are still inscribed in them. The maintenance of colonial era administrative records in imperial centers, I argue, preserves metropolitan control over the evidence of empire. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wali, for this great presentation. It was a pleasure. And um, yeah, it was uh, very interesting that you also pointed to the sensitive matters and matters of colonial violence, because in the last two days of the conference, we already had, had talked at some points about the possibility of re-traumatization when working with records from the colonial archive. So that connects your paper very well to the discussions we had before. Thank you. Um, I would now proceed, like to proceed to our final paper on this panel, um, Fabienne Chamelot. Um, welcome, Fabienne. Um, the, the paper Archives and the Decolonization Process in French West Africa, 1958 to 1961. Welcome, Fabienne. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to, uh, well, hopefully everyone hears me um, and the sound is good. and. I'm going to share my screen. There it is. Um, so this uh, paper uh, addresses the negotiation of the ownership of the colonial archives between France and, and Senegal um, that, uh, that happened in West, uh, in French West Africa, so uh, uh, Afrique Occidentale Française, uh, AOF, uh, during the decolonization process. Uh, and it made, mainly took place between uh, 1958 and 1960. Um, this case study uh, is interesting because it provides a striking contrast with what happens in the rest uh, of the French colonial empire to, uh, to the colonial archives, where basically archives were uh, divided into two groups, the sovereignty archives that were transferred uh, to France, to mainland France, and uh, the, the administrative archives that remained uh, in the newly independent countries. So in the case of AOF, uh, all the archives remained in Senegal and were not transferred to France. And it's the only country uh, and in the only uh, former colony, colony where it happened. Um, um, so I'm going to start with um, a short historical uh, context. I'm not going to be able to, to go into uh, into the details, obviously. Um, but um, so this is uh, a map uh, of uh, AOF uh, with with Senegal in red here. Uh, not that you not that I assume that you don't know you don't know where it is. But uh, I really wanted to stress the size uh, of the whole territory. So AOF was really a federation of colonies, and Senegal was uh, one of them here. Um, where was uh, located the government general and the, so the central uh, governing body of AOF um, that was in, uh, in Dakar precisely. Um, the archives office uh, in AOF was created in 1911 
Um, so that's quite early compared to other territories. It's actually the first uh, the first um, archives office that was created uh, in the French colonial empire. But despite being created that early, the, the archives in AOF remained for most of their existence uh, in a very chaotic state uh, and were pretty much uh, uncared for, um, except for a few exceptions. It's only uh, in 1954 uh, that the archives were classified for the first time um, and, uh, and finding it uh, created uh, thanks to the work of Jacques Charpie, who was a French archivist uh, appointed as head of archives in AOF in 1952. Um, Sharpie um, then um, stepped down uh, from his position in AOF to go back to France in 1958. And that's when Jean-Francois Morel, also a French archivist, uh, took um, what well, replaced him and took the position of uh, head of archives in AOF. Um, so Sharpie and uh, Morel are the two uh, are two of the main, uh, two of the key figures. Of, uh, of this case study um, and, uh, and there's a third one so you can you can have them here uh, in photos. Uh, unfortunately I wasn't able to find a photo of, uh, of the third key figure which is Carlo Laroche. Uh, Carlo Laroche was the head of archives of the Ministry of Overseas France in Paris. Uh, he was also a French archivist, and all of these uh, three archivists, Charpie, Morel, and Laroche, uh, were uh, actually had a common background in the sense that they were trained in the same school, uh, and they um, they received the same uh, training, and, and for that reason, they were part of the of the same community. Uh, which is the Chartist, uh, I, for those who know about it. Um, the negotiation process uh, in itself uh, started uh, at the initiative of Jean-François Morel, um, in uh, in 1958, so uh, when uh, as he took his position as head of archives in AOF, uh, Jean-François Morel was actually uh, concerned about what would happen to the archives in AOF during the decolonization process that was um, already uh, that had already started um, at that point, and. Um, uh, and he wrote uh, a letter to Carlo Laroche uh, in, at the ministry uh, in Paris uh, to, uh, to raise the issue to him. So the conversation only started between two archivists, basically, on, on the technical uh, grounds. Um, and the, uh, the view of Morel was that the archives of AOF should not be um, dismantled, and uh, that what happened in, on other territories in the French colonial empire, which is the, the, the division between sovereignty archives and administrative archives and, and the sovereignty archives uh, being transferred to France, was not uh, an option for the archives in AOF because uh, in his view and um, in his professional uh, view, he thought that it was going against every, um, every basic principle of archival science, uh, notably the principle of, proven uh, of provenance. Um, so that was uh, Morel's view, and when he reached out to La Roche uh, in France to um, to advocate for uh, for it. Um, Actually, La Roche had uh, a, a very different point of view and quite the opposite uh, point of view, actually, because he thought that um, the AOF archive, there was no reason to make an exception for the archives in AOF in his view. Uh, the process of sovereignty archives um, being transferred to France had already begun. So in his view, uh, which was uh, the metropolitan view from the ministry, uh, there was no reason to make, some, to make an exception for uh, for AOF um, and, uh, and the integrity of the archival form of the collection was the sovereignty archives. Uh, he thought and he argued that um, the unity of the colonial archives, uh, of uh, well, more precisely, the unity of the sovereignty uh, archives uh, prevailed to that of local archives and to the integrity of, of AOF archives as a local archive. Um, so they reached to a point where uh, they uh, couldn't really agree on, uh, on an option. Um, 
and uh, that's when La Roche actually reached out to, uh, to Sharpie, who was then an archivist back in France, um, and, uh, and basically uh, told him that he was really puzzled by, uh, by Morel's um, point of view, because in his view, he wasn't defending uh, France's interest, even though he was a French archivist himself. Um, so Sharpie, from uh, from that point on, uh, Sharpie served uh, and operated, if you will, as a sort of go-between between between the two of them. Um, at first, Sharpie was really hesitant um, about taking um, a formal uh, or, uh, or um, an explicit position in this uh, in this debate, and eventually he joined uh, Morel's view that the uh, the archives in AOF should. Would remain in AOF in Senegal. Um, and, uh, and at some point, uh, and, that, and that's eventually what happened, uh, La Roche um, didn't, uh, never uh, actually agreed to this view, but at some point he stopped arguing. I'm not sure exactly uh, why, when maybe he was precisely overwhelmed with all the uh, archives being transferred from, from the other former colonies, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, eventually he stopped fighting and an argument, uh, an agreement, sorry, uh, was made uh, between Senegal and France uh, that said that all the archives would remain um, uh, in Senegal. Uh, but that France would remain the official uh, ownership, uh, owner of those archives. And uh, so that was the compromise that was found. And in exchange for, um, for that, France would receive uh, microfilms uh, micro of, uh, of, of the archives, uh, of the sovereignty archives, basically, that stayed uh, in Senegal. Uh, in 1959, the uh, Haut Commissaire in Dakar, which was the governing uh, body, uh, French governing body in Dakar at that time, um, sealed the settlement and agreed to it uh, with, uh, with the OK as well of the uh, General Secretary of the Communauté Française uh, back in, uh, in Paris. Um, <coughs> Um, and uh, after uh, this agreement was signed, uh, the, the transfer of competence of our archives from Senegal, uh, from France to Senegal, uh, actually started on the 1st of April, 1959. And then something really uh, strange happened. Uh, in November, they said that, that year, 1959, the, um, the president of the Communauté Française, uh, that was the governing uh, body of all the former colonies at that time, um, notified uh, the, uh, the local governing body in AOF that, uh, that archives in AOF had to be transferred to France uh, and that it was not an option for France to, uh, to leave them uh, in Senegal. And um, so I have uh, the letter um, here that you can see. There it is. And you can see that the recipient uh, of this letter was quite surprised uh, actually with this uh, big ex exclamation point. And he wrote uh, in the margin but, uh, that um, this issue was settled actually eight months ago. And he was actually very surprised uh, that, um, that uh, the, the president of the Communauté Française uh, actually re re reacted that late and that the agreement was signed and that the the, the transfer of, of competence had already started and it was too late. Um, the outcome um, um, of, uh, of this case study is that uh, basically, so uh, Morel, Jean-François Morel remained uh, the archivist of uh, what became then the National Archives in Senegal until 1977. Uh, under the uh, policy of cooperation um, between Senegal and France. And it's only in 1977 that a Senegalese archivist became, uh, uh, became uh, the di director of the National Archives in Senegal. Um, so this case study uh, is really interesting because it raises uh, crucial issues uh, 
with regards to decolonization and archives, um, basically. And first of all, the, the first element to it is that it's the discussion uh, that uh, only happened with, between French people, uh, actually, and between French archivists. And uh, Senegal was, was not involved uh, in, in, in the discussions, um, at least uh, to, until very late. Um, and um, so it's also so uh, as as much as uh, it is said to be a negotiation, it's usually how it's narrated. Um, it's uh, I, I think this notion can be interrogated. In fact, it was more of a discussion between archivists uh, and and strategy, uh, even if you will. But whether or not it was negotiation, I think is subject to debate. Um, and uh, the second element of it is the importance of, importance of network uh, in, this, uh, in this issue, because uh, precisely the discussion happened between French archivists who knew each other very well, uh, who were colleagues, basically. And once they um, found um, an agreement, some sort of, uh, uh, of agreement amongst them, uh, then they, they brought it to the, to the politician level. Um, really so um and that is highlighted by the sources that uh, i was able to find because this conversation between them happened uh, via pers personal correspondence uh, and not official uh, letters so that the tone of the letter was much more uh, relaxed uh, and candid uh, as well that anything you would find in, in official uh, negotiation or official correspondence um, the third element that I wanted to point out uh, was this uh, idea of um, expertise versus politics. Um, I think it's very interesting that, uh, first of all, the, uh, the metropolitan um, um, decision makers entered uh, and reacted, well, entered the conversation and reacted very, very late in the process. Uh, and that really shows a disconnection between uh, different uh, levels of hierarchy uh, in, within, uh, within the very governing bodies of, uh, of French, uh, French community uh, at that time, Communauté Française. Uh, and uh, it also, uh, it's also interesting because uh, it raises the question of whether you can really distinguish between expertise and politics and whether there is really a clear cut divide between uh, between the two, because you have these two experts, uh, Laroche on the one hand and Morel on the other hand, who have the same background, who talks the same language in, as far as archival science goes, and yet they come up with very, very opposite conclusion uh, conclusions in, in terms of what to do uh, with this uh, uh, with these uh, archives and what is the right way uh, to uh, to apply archival science and archival principle to this uh, to this issue uh, to these uh, archives uh, and I think uh, that um, this difference of perspective um, makes sense uh, um, if we uh, if we contextualize each uh, of these archivists uh, La Roche who was the head of archives at the ministry in France uh, was actually speaking from a metropolitan point of view, and he had this global idea of colonial archives that was a whole, that was an ensemble, uh, and, um, and within this ensemble, the sovereignty archives being the property of France, and because they were the property of France, in his view, they had some integrity. Um, whereas, on the other hand, uh, Morel uh, spoke from a very local uh, or more local um, perspective, which was AOF, uh, which was the colony, and, and therefore, in his view, uh, the, the archives, um, well, the geographical um, principle uh, prevailed to that of, uh, of the political view that, uh, uh, that uh, La Roche was actually defending. Um, and the last point that uh, I want to point out um, is that uh, it's also very interesting to see, um, well, to interrogate this notion of decolonization, at least in, in the 50s. 
uh, and that echoes um, some some uh, some uh, elements of the of the discussion that happened yesterday um, with the uh, in the panel of um, that was entitled "Is it really decolonization?" Uh, because um, even though to this day Morel and Sharpie's legacy is seen as uh, as one that defended Senegal's rights uh, and Senegal's interest. Uh, it's very clear from their correspondence that um, in their view, they, um, they wanted to create a network uh, between uh, Senegalese, well, future uh, Senegalese archivists and themselves, and, uh, and actually to create some, um, to maintain uh, a bond and some ties between France and, and Senegal with regards to archives. Uh, they never spoke uh, about uh, independence. They never spoke about uh, cutting ties uh, uh, between Senegal and France. And, in, 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 and it's interesting because uh, at that time, we have to remember that the, the decolonization process in French West Africa was actually the alternative uh, to uh, that was pro that that was uh, on the table to uh, to a full independence uh, of Senegal. So the decolonization process in their mind at that time was not about cutting ties um, with France, but it was uh, trying to find a different ground and a different basis uh, for uh, France and its former colonies to interact and to keep a relationship, if you will. Um, so, um, and that's indeed partly what happened with the cooperation policy uh, that that uh, that um, that had uh, Morel uh, remained as head of archives in Senegal until 1977. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop here uh, for uh, for this presentation. I, as as a sort of conclusion, I just wanted to point out that's one one uh, major element that I wasn't able to address in this presentation is um, the, the countries um, of AOF, the former colonies of AOF, um, uh, um, apart from uh, Senegal. These countries were also concerned with AOF archives, obviously. Um, and at some point, some of them uh, tried to enter the negotiation and to, and to claim uh, rights over, over those archives. Um, I don't have the details uh, of it, and I don't know who has the details of it because I wasn't able to look to locate the sources. I was able to locate empty folders, so those records existed at some point, but uh, obviously they, they've been retrieved from the folders and, and um, I don't know where they are, um, but but it's been uh, also a point of contention and, and tensions um, in in, um, in in West Africa and until these days because some of the uh, of the other uh, countries of AOF uh, obviously wanted uh, and claimed rights to those archives and it's another negotiation and another as aspect of this case study that I wasn't able to to engage with unfortunately. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Fabienne, um, for unfolding this uh, complex micro history of um, the Senegal archives. And um, yeah, I guess there are very a few the, um, very interesting to dig deeper into the problematic issues in case of ownership and negotiation and uh, the complexity you mentioned at the end with the other countries of the AOF. Um, but for now, I would like to uh, welcome Forget Chaterera Sambuku for the for her command. So I'm looking forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jan. Wow, that was breathtaking. I hope I'm going to be able to do justice to all your presentations. Uh, thank you so much, Rakesh, Riley, and uh, Fabian for your powerful and insightful presentations. And indeed, I also want to thank Jan for introducing the session. And as indicated by Jan in his uh, introductory remarks, this panel is about the colonial archive. Thus, archival records and uh, archival institutions that were created and maintained under colonial rule. However, I beg to differ on a point uh, raised by Jan during his uh, introductory remarks. Correct me if I heard you wrong. Uh, 
but uh, you said, um, I quote, in the process of decolonization, the archives of the colonial powers were partly taken out of the country and thus withdrawn uh, from the control of the former uh, colonized. So actually, I perceive the act of taking archives uh, from their country of creation is actually a continuation of uh, colonization rather than decolonization. Because uh, from my little understanding of uh, decolonization, I believe it's a process that is grounded in giving power, independence, and control to those who were once colonized. So I'm thinking what kind of decolonization is this that takes away a people's uh, heritage, a people's history away from them? As noted by Riley in her presentation, the maintenance, again, I would like to quote, the maintenance of colonial administrative files in former metropoles partly preserves the conditions that facilitated colonial conquest and extraction. So I, I was uh, privileged to be present in the previous uh, session where George Abung uh, made a presentation that is connected to what we are discussing right now. He said, there is no finalization of the colonial agenda for as long as we still have artifacts or records being held by the former colonizers. So again, in the ways of uh, George Abungu, the colonial bondage continues. Uh, moving on to the first presentation of this panel that was given by Rakesh, in trust of three nations. That was uh, quite interesting. Rakesh, and thank you once again for that uh, imaginative style of expression on the debate around the British Indian history. Who is interested in studying this history? is a question that was vividly echoed in your presentation, and I would like to throw it back to you once again and to the audience. Uh, the other thing you noted, Rakesh, was that there are 280,000 printed volumes, 25,000 rare manuscripts, paintings, photographs, and uh, about 120,000 volumes of archival material that belong to undivided India. This is indeed a huge volume of material, and I can only imagine the size of gap created by the absence of these archival materials. But my concern is on the accuracy of both the volume and the nature of the archival material whose statistics and details you provided. This I'm asking because in the case of my country, Zimbabwe, in other Southern African countries like uh, Zambia, Botswana, uh, even in East Africa, Kenya included, the volume and nature of the records that were taken away from the country is actually not known. This implies that much as we are pushing for the restitution or repatriation of migrated archives, suppose Britain agrees to repatriating these archives, it's actually up to them to release what they want to give us, and no one will be in a position to ascertain if everything has been retained. No one can dispute it. Uh, I noted something interesting in your presentation again, Rakesh. I would want to find out what is your opinion regarding Malcolm McDonald counter offer, which says that ownership shall be shared between UK, India, and Pakistan. How realistic and beneficial is this to the parties involved? Again, you noted that it was recommended that a tripartite committee be appointed to oversee the management of the library. And I'm interested in knowing whether the committee was uh, actually appointed, was it uh, appointed, is it functional? And how effective is it in ensuring the appropriate management of the documentary heritage in question? If at all, it was established. Then indeed, the law has failed to see the repatriation of archives back to their provenance. Well, this is not only the case of India, but uh, of many other countries that have been trying to get back their documentary heritage. So I would want to know, what is your comment on the laws that are being applied to settle matters of archival material 
being held in foreign lands in the UK or in France. Do you think that applying the law is the best route to pursue this matter? Are there any other ways that can be pursued to settle this matter since, as you rightfully mentioned in your presentation, there's some kind of jugglery of law? Again, to what extent, Rakesh, is uh, Kabir's assertion in the 1960s that the India-Pakistan library currently held in London is not a dispersal, but a sharing of the treasure. I would really want to hear your opinion because uh, this is some kind of phrase that I have been coming across even in my readings and on other platforms where issues of migrated archives are being discussed. There appears to be a pushed agenda for us to recognize this aspect as a shared heritage and not necessarily perceive it as dispersal. So I was happy to hear it coming out in your presentation and I would want to find out what you or others listening to me believe in. Is it really not a dispersal? Can we consider it as a shared treasure? Then uh, last but not least pertaining to Rakesh's uh, presentation, you said Pakistan was prepared to forgo the antiquarian material uh, if it could receive a photostat reproduction of the material. And then you went on to say that uh, the question was who would foot the bill, which was estimated to a huge uh, amount, millions of pounds, so to say. So I guess that question remains to this date. Nonetheless, my question is that would India and other concerned parties be satisfied in having digital copies of the library, if for instance, maybe a donor is to be found to meet the financial implications of a digitization project. Will that solve the case? Will you be satisfied in having the digital uh, surrogates of the archives in question? Then uh, going on to Riley, in your introductory remarks, you questioned the purpose of a post-colonial national archive before any public records of the new government could be considered for permanent preservation. So allow me to reiterate your question, Riley, and emphasize that. Indeed, Kenya recognized the agency with which uh, she needed to ensure the restitution of archives that had been taken out of the country. It's unfortunate that up to this day, the battle for the retain of those archives still rages on. Yet the immediate establishment of uh, a national archives in Kenya was a way of acknowledging the need for Kenya's archives to be retained to their provenance. Then uh, of interest to note in your presentation, Riley, is that you said, the pursuit of uh, sensitive and secret records that the British colonial government removed from Kenya to London around the time of independence has gone on since at least the early 1970s and it is still unresolved. So to this effort, do you think it's worth it for Kenya and other countries in a similar situation like mine to keep pursuing the matter? What are the chances really, I mean, real chances of getting the desired results? Are we not chasing a ghost? Would you recommend today's archivists, this might be uh, taken up by anyone else who may not be Riley. Would you recommend today's archivists to keep chasing the matter or probably suggest that they let sleeping dogs lie? So like I said, the question can be answered by anyone, Rakesh, Fabian, or even the audience. And uh, thank you, thank you, Fabian, for that uh, insightful presentation. And I wish to sincerely congratulate Senegal for being the only one, uh, the only colonized territory by France that kept colonial archives on the ground. You know what? This is a statement that I actually wrote based on the presentation you sent me uh, prior to this uh, whole presentation. But then I laughed inside of myself when I got some new revelations that were not in that short abstract you sent me. You said there are some files 
uh, whose records are not found, the files are like blank. So I'm thinking there is a catch. I was really asking myself a lot of questions as to how did Senegal of all the countries manage to keep its records on the ground? Then I'm thinking there's something, there's something I miss here. Probably it is just not formally reported, but some records were taken away now that I got to land of uh, uh, the files whose records are not inside. So, but anyway, I meant to ask if you can explain to me, um, uh, well, there's one thing that you noted. You, you say that the France kept, uh, like retained ownership of the records. So can you explain to me like on what basis uh, the archives belong to France? Of course you said uh, the records remained on uh, Senegalese soil, but ownership belongs to France and I failed to get it. How exactly, on what basis do they belong to France? These archives are records that were created on Senegalese soil, possibly using Senegalese resources. So the records were like capturing events that were occurring in Senegal. And now on what grounds exactly does France justify ownership of uh, these archives? It's incredible to hear that uh, Senegal decision makers and leaders were never involved in the process. This represents to me a clear perpetuation of uh, the colonial ide ideologies and white supremacy. It's unethical in my own thinking and so belittling to say the least for critical decisions about a country to be made without the participation of the leaders of that country. So maybe there's a good explanation behind that. I would be interested in hearing it. Why weren't they involved in the process? My last concern goes to all the presenters of this session and again, even to every person who is listening to me right now. It's quite apparent that uh, other heritage management institutions, especially museums, they seem to have a much more better response to issues of restitution. And there appears like to be a higher level of understanding among museum management professionals, authorities on the need to retain, uh, you know, stolen objects. And just, uh, Two weeks back, I was seeing France 24, it was awash with news of the Benin artifacts being retained to, to Benin by France. And there has been so many of uh, similar cases. So to me, when I just uh, take a snapshot of what is happening, it seems as if uh, there's a better response from the museums than the archival sector. What could be the explanation? Could it be that the archives are more sensitive or maybe there's another probable reason? That's my submission, Jan, and thank you once again for uh, having me in this uh, panel. Thank you for that, and uh, thank you as well for um, hearing so closely to my introductionary words, and um, I'm sorry for the inaccuracy in my, um, of course, I didn't mean that this is really decolonization. And uh, I think it fits very good what you said to uh, that uh, Wayne Modest already reminded us yesterday to use terms very carefully when we speak of decolonization and colonization. So thank you for receiving as well a comment by you. And I guess we can now um, be put together on the screen all to, um, and the co-panelists can respond to your thoughts. We have um, about 10 minutes left for discussion. I'm sorry, but we have to leave then for the next, um, the final, um, roundtable discussion, but um, please go ahead. Um, so um, you are free to answer to the comments from project. Should I abuse the order of speakers to claim the right to first response as well? <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, indeed closely listening and um, for these seven star questions, some of whom are very easy to answer as well because they are more point of information and some perhaps I leave to my other co-panelists to pick the thread on. Uh, the question about accuracy of some of the, these factual claims is indeed problematic. Uh, 
These are indicative figures put together by a fact-finding committee that was established in October 1947 by all the three countries. But yes, uh, there, are, there are lies and then there are statistics. So all statistics are indicative truths. Uh, and, and, and so is it in this case as well. Digitalization has been a project ongoing since almost the 1980s. So there has, so there has been some sharing of documentation, some Xeroxing, some photostatting, and now of course, some digitalizing indeed. But again, it is the tip of the iceberg. It is the hidden that is more, more of, of greater significance than what is being, than what is being shared. At heart of both Malcolm McDonald's counter offer, as well as the tripartite committee, as well as the trust, the idea of the trust, by the way, none of these ever materialized. So none of this ever happened. These were all ideas on paper. But the idea behind all three initiatives was the question of ownership versus management. If ownership is conceded inch by inch, Today, it is possible that the location may become the important question tomorrow, in which case it would indeed become a question of dispersal. At the moment, archives, records, paintings, murals, they're all housed under one location, thereby allowing a certain kind of access to it. But if indeed the question of location, following on from the question of ownership becomes important, then we have a different issue at hand. So much of it was about as, as you rightly picked up, the jugglery of uh, ownership, administration, management, and accessibility. If all these four can be delinked from each other, then both sides can save their political faces. Laws. It's a tricky question again. Both India and Pakistan were members of the Commonwealth. So much of the question hinged on whether they wanted it to remain, uh, to make it a family dispute quote unquote, between Commonwealth nations, or were they eager to take the case to the International Court of Justice or to the United Nations, uh, UNESCO, in particular, the United Nations Educational and Scientific Cultural Organization. Again, an unresolved question, perhaps the political will on both sides diminished over time. Who is interested in writing British Indian history? This is a debate that is ongoing. Uh, the decolonizing history, decolonizing curriculum questions are very much a part of this debate. The Indian diaspora, Pakistani diaspora, Bangladeshi diaspora in Britain is now an active participant more than ever in this debate. So once again, there are multiple fronts here. The subcontinental scholarly apparatus, the islandic, um, and by that I mean the British island story and its, um, its scholarship. The last point about artifacts versus documents, and here I invite both my co-panelists to weigh in. I personally feel that unlike the sensational or the glamorous question of the Kohinoor diamonds or a marble here, a sword there, uh, objects which have a very different kind of materiality, both in terms of their hold on public imagination both in terms of their signifying a certain kind of nationalist um, personification, I do think that documents are a more difficult, a more delicate, a more diffused, and indeed a more sensitive case to be made. And so I'm not surprised for one, that while off and on, the Indian prime minister was recently in the United States, he returned back with great fanfare with 157 objects that were in the American museums. So much of it sort of boils down to what kind of uh, political case can be made for historiography. Uh, coming from India, I cannot but end on the last point that higher education in India is very much a class, um, an elite exercise. It remains even to this day in the continent that hosts perhaps the largest number of poor people in the world. So to make a, a resonance, a nationalistic resonance around exercises of history writing, access to archives, uh, largely in the language of the former colonizer in an Anglophone world, is an issue that requires a lot more um, purchase than is, usually, than is usually offered. So to Riley and to Fabian to help me here and to carry the conversation forward. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Rakesh, for getting us started. And, and thank you again, for Get, for your, for your very um, insightful comments across all three or four, if we also think of the introduction um, papers. I think <clears throat> in the hopes that perhaps we get more questions from the listeners, I'll, I'll keep my response to two points. Um, first, in response to your second question, um, is it worth what I recommend that Kenya continues its pursuit for these migrated archives? And I really um, appreciate the, the poetry and um, sort of truth in the question, is it not just chasing ghosts? And I would make a point first and foremost in my response of saying, I'm not the person to, to um, answer that question. Um, the story of the migrated archives is also a story of self-interested <laughs> scholars working in the global North, making claims to the ownership location and use of these records and I, I try as much as possible and not perfectly to be mindful of my own positionality. I'm not, um, in the words of Fabienne, an expert here. I, I, I want to be clear of what my politics are. Um, and in that, in that vein, um, the story of the migrated archives is only known because of the persistence, not just of Kenyan government officials through the Kenyan National Archives, but because of folks who survived the emergency, who despite the ban on Mau Mau persisted in their claims and worked together, not just alone, with historians across the globe, archivists across the globe, so a true international coalition. And this was not an easy task, precisely because of the um, concealment by design by the FCO, one of the world's largest, most powerful governmental organizations, that power did not diminish with the end of empire. Um, so I would say, yes, we must insist on the question of archival restitution, um, where these archives should return, to whom, I think these are very contested terms. And, and also to return to one of the themes of the, the last session, do we need new language? I, I think not, but I do think that heritage debates fall trapped to questions of sovereignty in a way that does a disservice. So in 1983, there's a Vienna Convention on decolonize or on the question of archival ownership. And to Jan's point about the importance of language, decolonization in 1983 was referred to as state succession. And this is legally very critical because it recognizes and creates an opening for the imperial sovereign power to be regarded as legitimate. So in 1983, the, the, the Vienna Convention's legal terms regards colonial administrations as a state. And this convention is, is unsuccessful in resolving the issue of colonial archives precisely because of that. And secondly, because it provided an occasion for European powers, specifically the French and British government, to conspire behind closed doors to create a block, a voting block, to say we are not going to assent to this convention. So I do think that these are matters which do not resolve themselves and from a theory of change perspective require constant engagement. But I would not say from only my perspective, but again from this sort of global coalition. Um, yeah, so I, I would I would end there and thank you again. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We have only two minutes left, so I'm sorry, Fabian, but um, uh, I'm sorry you only have three. Oh, okay. Do you still want me to answer uh, or try to answer? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, with the last questions um, as, as uh, in order to weigh in. Um, with uh, to what my co-panelists said. Well, in, in terms of um, uh, the, the difference between uh, the response to artifacts um, and, uh, and archives, uh, it, it is very different indeed. Uh, and it really uh, echoes uh, the news in France uh, these days, because actually while the uh, Benin artifacts were uh, returned, access to some colonial or to some archives and specifically to some colonial archives in France has been restrained uh, really and that's a massive uh, controversy and massive point of uh, discussion uh, and outrage from the French historians and and the historians working on French history and French colonial history as well um, so the difference is clearly um, there yeah the response is, uh, is is very very different and archives seem to be more sensitive to uh, to the eye of the government uh, 
uh, and I think that it's probably because when, when we are, as researchers um, look at uh, archives as uh, sources for history, from a government po po point of view, there's an element of accountability. Uh, and that's, uh, and that's, what, that, that's probably what they have prim primarily in mind uh, um, in those conversations and discussions. Yes, and I see that I have to stop. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. We have to stop our discussion by now. Uh, it was a pleasure to having you here and maybe we can later take this discuss discussion to the Wonder Me room if you'd like to join us there. So I'm sorry that we didn't have the time to go deeper into the details, but thank you for doing a great job and this great panel. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, the concluding roundtable podium will be live streamed out of a studio in Berlin. So we have to move everyone to the live stream now. Um, please leave this room, the Zoom room with me and use the link on the website under the menu podium. You will find it on the website right away. You are offered two live stream streams, one in German and one uh, with the English transla translation. So pay attention which uh, link you use. So again, thank you for the panel and see you at the podium. <laughs>